Hi, my name is Alex Dolphin and welcome back to another episode of Ex Ante. Today we're going to discuss the case of Step Saver Data Systems versus Wise Technology. This case was heard in the year of 1991 in the Third District Court of Appeals. Let's go ahead and jump into the facts of the case. So Step Saver was an early form of a computer manufacturer. They were selling early forms of computers to offices with doctors in them, with lawyers in them. These computers had a centralized hub and then they had terminals that would go off of that centralized hub. So the centralized hub was purchased uh, from IBM for StepSaver. So StepSaver bought the centralized hub from IBM. And then the terminals that uh, went out to, so like all the individual employees at the office, those terminals were purchased from Wise Technology. The software that went on these terminals and on the, on the central hub was purchased from the software link, which we'll refer to as TSL. So TSL is the software company. Um, so everything was hunky-dory. Uh, StepSaver is selling a bunch of these systems out, over 100 to offices, you know, and it's, it's lucrative. They're doing a good business. Um, and then quickly after the, a few customers begin to use these machines, there's issues. Um, the software isn't working. There's a real problem with it. And uh, they're like, hey, StepSaver, you told us this computer was going to work. What's going on with it? So StepSaver's like, hey, TSL, you told us your software was going to work. What's going on with it? So that's the, the source of the issue. Um, and to resolve the issue, we need to look to the, form, the terms of the contract. And the terms of the contract aren't clear on the surface because there's two different points in which the parties argue a contract was formed. TSL, when they sent the software to StepSaver, sent the software with a box top agreement. This box top agreement had some terms that were different from what um, from what TSL and StepSaver had originally agreed to before the software was sent. So TSL is going to argue that the contract was formed when StepSaver opened up the box and unboxed the software and read those terms that were on the box. Whereas StepSaver is going to argue that the contract was formed before the software was actually sent to them. So the question and why that's important is because the box top limits the liability for TSL, for the software company. It limits the liability pretty strictly so that StepSaver wouldn't be able to recover um, from TSL for faulty software. Whereas in the earlier conversation, there was not much of a discussion about warranties. The court doesn't really discuss that, but there was definitely no limitation um, as stringent as was in the box top agreement that was sent by TSL to StepSaver. So court has to decide which one, which version of the contract they're going to accept. Are they going to say it was formed when the software was sent? Or are they going to say it was formed when, um, when StepSaver opened the box of the software and saw those terms of agreement on the box? So that's the question before the court. The court is going to turn to the Uniform Commercial Code um, 2207, uh, Section 2207, and they're going to look to that to try and resolve this issue. Section 2207 says, um, that a definite and seasonable expression of acceptance for a written confirmation, which is sent within a reasonable time, operates as an acceptance, even though it states terms additional. So what the UCC is saying here is that if additional terms are sent in a final form, they, it can still, um, if, if an acceptance is sent with additional forms, um, those additional forms can make their way into the contract unless those additional terms materially alter the agreement um, or, you know, there's been already a limitation of the acceptance on, you know, not having additional terms added in. So the court is going to say that the box top agreement materially alters the contract between the two parties. They're going to say this because there was some evidence introduced wherein a salesman from TSL was discussing uh, with, you know, a, a purchaser from StepSaver and StepSaver basically said, hey, if we buy this software from you, can we you know, relicense it to the people who purchase our computers from them? And the guy's like, yep, that's fine. The salesman says, yeah, that's fine to resell this software down the line. The box top agreement though, number one point on it was to say that you can't resell this software. So that inconsistency right there um, is what the court is going to look to to say, hey, this box top actually materially alters the contract that was formed between these two parties. And for that reason, we're going to strike down the terms that materially alter this contract, and we're going to have to look for some default rules uh, if there's no warranty to be found in the prior negotiations. So that's what they remand to the trial court, and they say, hey, you guys need to figure that out. Um, were there terms of warranty in the original negotiations? If they're not, then we probably ought to insert some, some gap fillers. So that's the case. That's what you need to know uh, for your brief, and let's go ahead and jump into some ex-ante implications. 
So the first ex-ante implication is going to be that parties won't send box top agreements that materially alter the form of the contract because they know that they're not going to hold up in court. That's what this precedent is setting. I think that that's good because if companies don't send box top agreements, there's going to be less litigation in the future, right? If both parties can just actually agree to the terms of the contract before they act as if there's a contract, then we're not going to have as much litigation. The courts won't be strapped for as much resources. On the other side of this, it seems pretty clear that StepSaver was informed of these alternate terms. Um, and even, you know, TSL even gave them an opportunity to send the software back and be refunded if they didn't agree to the terms um, with no expense to them. So it seems a little bit unintuitive that, you know, someone looking at a box, reading these terms, and then opens it, disregarding those terms, thinking that they won't even, you know, hold up in court, isn't going to be held to those terms that they expressly, you know, disavowed by opening the package. So intuitively, we might want to think that, well, you know, TSL really tried to put uh, tried to put StepSaver on notice when they sent this box top agreement, and it seems like they did the best job that they could, and they gave StepSaver a reasonable out by saying, hey, you can send the package back at no cost to you. So maybe we should rule in favor uh, in favor of uh, the software company. We have to think about the implications of that though. And, and like I said earlier, we want to disincentivize parties from not agreeing to terms before a contract is formed. And this ruling will certainly incentivize parties to agree to terms before a contract is formed. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you'd like to see more, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.